What kind of clothes did you guys wear? You know, what kind of dresser were you, Michael? Were you a shop dresser? I get a lot of that stuff. And I gotta be honest, there was a lot of stylish mob guys, guys that dressed really well. There was a lot that didn't, but a lot of guys that, you know, really set style. Obviously, John Gotti, we know that. Uh, but there were a few others, and I found a list of 10 of them, and they're kind of in order. You may agree, you may disagree. I'll give you my comments on that. Hey everyone, time for another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good, very blessed on this end. As always, we give God all the praise, honor, glory, and thanksgiving for that. Based upon many of the messages that I get from you, the comments, my team goes through them. We get thousands of them. And every once in a while, I go through as best I can because we get so many across all social media platforms. But I do it because I want to see what you're liking, what you're not liking. A lot of you have requests. Michael, can you, you know, talk about this or can you do a video on that? And I get a lot of uh, comments about what kind of clothes did you guys wear? You know, what kind of dresser were you, Michael? Were you a shop dresser? I get a lot of that stuff. So I decided to do something today on, you know, who I consider to be some good mob guys, how they dressed. And uh, another, you know, interesting thing, whenever I go see young kids, when I visit them in detention centers, I speak to a lot of these gangbangers. Some of the things they say, you know, come on, Michael, you had it all. You had, you know, you had the money, you had the cars, you had the power, you were best dressed. They always comment on the dress. And of course, I'm trying to dissuade them from the street life, not get them involved, tell them it's a dead end street. You know, I go through it all. And uh, they'll cite the movies. Ah, you know, we saw that in Goodfellas. We saw that in, you know, Godfather. I say, I know, but did you see the end of the movie? who got killed, who went to jail, who lost this, who lost that. They don't see the end of the movie. They see the money, they see the clothes, they see the power, that's it. Let's face it, fashion is a big deal. Whenever you go to the awards show, what's the biggest thing? Red carpet, what are these people going to be wearing? What do you read the next day in uh, the newspapers or online? What they wore, what the wardrobe was, especially the women. Uh, so it's a big deal. And I got to be honest, there was a lot of stylish mob guys, guys that dressed really well. There was a lot that didn't, but a lot of guys that, you know, really set style. Obviously, John Gotti, we know that. Uh, but there were a few others, and I found a list of 10 of them, and they're kind of in order. You may agree, you may disagree. I'll give you my comments on that. Uh, but before I do that, let me tell you about myself. I wouldn't consider myself a real flashy dresser. I wasn't really into it. I had probably 100 suits during that time because I had to wear a suit every day and sometimes one in during the day and one at night. So I had a lot of suits and I hated to shop. I hated. So I would go in, I'd get, you know, 10 suits at a time. This way I had them. Uh, some of them did fall off the back of the truck. You know that expression. We always had deals going on. But I had about 100 suits. And whenever I would go buy casual clothes, if I liked a pair of pants, I'd buy in 10 different colors, you know, so I had them. I wouldn't have to shop that much. You know, I was, that's how I was. But, you know, I normally dressed, I was always neat because I was, you know, a, kind of a neat freak in many ways. And my crew dressed up pretty good too. We weren't known as the best dressers, but they dressed up pretty good too. My dad, very sharp dresser um, at times when he had his suit on. But man, I can tell you when he wasn't, uh, you know, going out or being formal, he had some crazy dress. I'll never forget when I played baseball when I was a kid and he would come and watch me, he'd come into the dugout and he'd be wearing Bermuda shorts down to his knees and, and knee length black socks with sandals on. And he would be sitting in my dugout. I'll never forget, and he'd be doing his neck exercises and all my friends on the team were looking at him. So, you know, he was a sharp dresser when he dressed up, you know, and he had to go to court and when he ever had to do his business. But outside of that, he didn't really care what he wore, you know, honestly. So, you know, let me give you, uh, uh, you know, these 10. And then, well, before I do that, let me tell you this. Some of the guys in my era that I remember were good dressers. Jerry Lang was a good dresser. Jerry Langella, you know, he was our underboss for a while. Little Dom Cataldo, they call him Good Looking Dom. Uh, I was on trial with him for several months in Manhattan. He was a flashy dresser, always dressed good, you know. Uh, and a lot of guys are pretty sharp. Junior, 
you know, he, he dressed up, you know, he wasn't the, the best dresser around, I'd say, but, you know, he was the boss, so he always had to look good. And there were a couple of others, but let me go through this list. I think you'll enjoy it. Some of these, I'm going to read it. You know, some of these guys, uh, well, probably all the guys, you know who they are. Uh, but I'll read a little bit of, about what they wrote, and we'll get into it, and we'll have some fun. First one, number 10 on the list, just going from 10 down to 1, Joe Adonis. Instrumental part in the early days of the National Crime Syndicate. You know who he was. He helped Luciano and, and Lansky take control of the mafia back then. He removed Joe the Boss, Sal Maranzano. And uh, he helped form the commission at that time. Adonis wasn't his real name. We aren't 100% sure where he got his name from. But speculation has it that he adopted the name himself, Adonis. You know, it's supposed to be a good-looking, masculine, God type of guy. Adonis spent a great deal of time on his personal appearance with daily grooming routines. A lot of guys like to go to the Baba, believe it or not, every single day. A lot of guys in my era, they would go every day, they'd get shaven, they'd get their hair styled. They wouldn't do it at home. It's crazy, but they did it. On one occasion, it said that Luciano caught Joe Adonis combing his hair in front of a mirror and asked him, who do you think you are, Rudolph Valentino? And Adonis replied, for looks, that guy's a bum. Now, he was supposed to be the best-looking guy in Hollywood that time, but Adonis called him a bum. You would always see Adonis, uh, Adonis wearing a fedora. Uh, you know what? I like the fedora era. I mean, when a, guy, a lot of guys wore it back then. My father wore one for a while, but I really liked that era. You don't see it that much. In my era, you didn't see it that much. But when you look back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, it was a cool look. It really was, and we miss that right now. Uh, you'd always see Adonis wear, Adonis wearing a fedora and the finest suits New York had to offer. He was always well presented with not a hair out of place. Probably went to the barber every day. And that's why Adonis starts off our top 10 countdown coming in at number 10. So he made number 10. Number nine, Paul Castellano. Okay. I was with Paulie one occasion that I had to sit down with him. A few occasions when I drove Andrew Russo and Tom DeBella to meet with him. He was always dressed sharp, always had a suit on. He always gave that business type appearance. He had a lot of suits, obviously. When I seen him at weddings, because you know, I, I gotta be honest guys and, and ladies, in that era, weddings and funerals, there were times when I went to two weddings on a Saturday or a Sunday, funeral or two. There's times when my whole weekend was weddings and funerals, because we had to go. So there was, you know, many occasions where I saw Paulie there and he always dressed sharp. And if he wasn't in a suit, you know, he dressed night. He had a college shirt on, but he always had a jacket on. I never seen him without a suit, you know, or a sports jacket. And obviously we know what happened when he got killed in front of Sparks. Uh, he was dressed in a suit that night, so it was appropriate for the way he dressed. So he came in at number nine. All right, number eight, Big Jim Colissimo. Now he was way back when and he had the fedora. Big Jim may have been assassinated as early as 1920, but he still made an impact in the Mustache Pete era of the Mafia. You know the Mustache Pete era, era the old timers that just came over from Italy, they had a whole different, very strict way of, of living and living out the code at that point in time. Uh, he was most famous for being the boss of what we now call the Chicago Outfit. So he was the first Chicago boss, really as well as being known for his restaurant located on South Wabash, Chicago. As you can see from a photo, and you'll see that, he was always a well-dressed character, sporting a flat cap, suit, leather gloves, and sometimes pictured with a cane. He didn't need a cane, but he used to walk with a cane. It was kind of elegant back then. So he comes in at number eight. Number seven, Lepke Butchwalter. You know who he is. The murder incorporated crime boss who ended up on the Sing Sing electric chair. He faced the death penalty, and uh, one of the few guys in that life that did get the death penalty. In 1944, due to a mobster turned informant, A.B. Rellis, Lepke, whose actual name was Lewis, would often be suited and booted, complete with a stereotypical mob hat. He would also complete his look with a handkerchief in his suit pocket and a matching overcoat. Sharp dresser. Too bad he met with a pretty serious fate. Whether he was being escorted by his cronies into a courtroom meeting, smiling at the camera, or giving a ruthless look, he was always dressed to impress. So as you know, he was a Jewish guy, and uh, he was one of the heads of Murder Incorporated, a group that they say was responsible for well over 100 murders, maybe more than that. And uh, the families used them. And um, you know, they were a rough group, let's put it that way. 
Number six, I thought he would be a little higher on the list, but Al Capone. Now, we all know about Al, but let me read what they wrote about him. One of the most notorious mobsters of the early 20th century, made famous for his violent temper and the scar down his face, which he hated, giving him the nickname Scarfaced. Most photos show Al Capone with a cigar in his mouth, he loved his cigars, and a felt Panama hat. Capone also wore a gold pocket watch complete with chain, which was clear to see against the tone of his charcoal suits. He liked dark suits. And every picture I saw with him with a suit on, he had that gold pocket watch. Despite having scars down his face, personal appearance meant a lot to Capone. And he would ask the cameraman to always take photos of the right side of his face rather than the scarred left side, as you can see here in a photo that they're showing, and I'm sure we'll put that up for you. So, I thought he would come up a little bit higher than that. Number five, Bugsy Siegel. I thought he would be number one. Siegel was a sharp dresser. We all know who he was. Hung out with Maya Lansky, very, very close with Lucky Luciano. And they say if Bugsy Siegel wasn't a mobster, he would have fitted right into the 1940s Hollywood actor scene. And he was friendly with a number of actors. He was a charismatic character who charmed the ladies and had film star good looks, good looking guy. Underneath was a darker side, as he was one of the mob's more violent members. I'm sure you saw the movie Bugsy with Warren Beatty, terrific movie, and uh, Warren Beatty played him well. Wherever Bugsy was, he was always dressed to wow the crowds. Whether he was wearing his famous polka dot suit, polka dot suit, completed with handkerchief and pinky ring, sporting a pinstripe suit, or donning a Panama hat, he always looked like he meant business. Heck, he even died looking dapper. You know the story of how he died. He was sitting in his uh, home in Beverly Hills when he got shot through the glass, through his eye. Unsolved murder. Tony was uh, at one time the second in command Beverly Hills Police Department. And uh, he brought me in and showed me some of the, uh, the things they had uh, that Bugsy was wearing. He actually had his, his uh, wallet, his license, a set of glasses. And, uh, you know, he took me through that and I saw it. And uh, there was blood stained on him also. I'll never forget so he was number five. Number four, Meyer Lansky. I didn't get this. I didn't think Meyer was that sharp a dresser, but they got him as number four. The mob's accountant, Meyer Lansky, who was the brains behind the mafia, true, in its most important era. He wasn't just Lucky Luciano's sidekick. He was the mastermind behind the casinos, both in the U.S. and Cuba. Very true. Being such a prominent character, it goes without saying that Lansky was always well-dressed. He had the mob's best interests at heart, and he knew how to evolve the mafia. Without him, it would be a totally different story. I don't know about that, but he certainly did have a big impact, and um, Lucky did listen to him quite a bit. I always was told that. You know, a lot of guys uh, in my former life, my, fa my father included, would never like to give Maya Lansky that much credit. I think because he was Jewish, he wasn't a made guy. But in reality, uh, he was a smart guy, and he did a lot you know, to bring the life where it was when I was involved in it. He helped Lucky form that commission, no doubt about it. It was Lansky, Siegel, and, um, and Lucky Luciano at the time. They were pretty much inseparable back then. So he was number four. Number three, Frank Costello. Totally agree with this. He was a sharp dresser. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was kind of my model, you know, mob guy. I think he, he did it the right way. The Prime Minister of the Underworld, a.k.a. Frank Costello, had politicians, judges, policemen, and mayors in his hand. You know, he knew how to work both sides of the street. He really did. You know, he was, uh, he was very, very smart in that regard. He was a smart business guy. And uh, he was kind of, to me, the model of what a mob boss should be, what a mobster should be, really. He was more a racketeer, but he was also a mobster. He was a combination of both, but a very, very smart guy. Uh, no, no question about it. He was influential in many decisions that changed history and changed the way the mafia evolved in the U.S. From a major gambling empire through to elections, he was one of the most powerful mob bosses to his live. You just can't deny it, people. The mafia in this country had an impact. Part of history, something you can't erase, you can't cancel, can't make believe they didn't exist. You know, I told you there was a, a group of people, 25,000 people in Miami, that signed a petition not to have Al Capone's house demolished. That's how much they felt that he was a part of their history. 
So, you know, in this cancel culture day, you can't cancel what happened. I mean, it happened. It's history. It might be an ugly part of history. It might be something you tell people you don't ever want to repeat, but it's history. And you can't get rid of it. It is what it is. Costello craved the respectability of high society, so he agreed to testify at the Kefauer hearings. He agreed to testify and not take the Fifth Amendment. Dressed in a gray suit with handkerchief in his left suit jacket pocket, Costello looked like a noble figure. His hat was also made famous, as it was at the time of wearing it that Vincent Giganti took a shot at him, which ripped through his hat but only grazed his head. You know what happened there? He was walking out of an elevator, I think, and uh, the chin shot at him, grazed his head. He went down, didn't kill him, obviously, but after that he uh, decided to walk away from that life. But interestingly, he agreed to testify in front of the Kefauver Committee. Now, would you call him a rat? Would you call him a snitch? Would you call him an informant? No. He went there as a business type of guy, and he testified. And I remember at one point watching the Kefauver Committee that he said, I will stand up and walk out of here because I came here voluntarily. So, you know, there are times when you come forward to the, you know, law enforcement, and again, he did this at the Keith Falber hearings. These congressional hearings are nothing but a show for people. Nothing comes out of them, ever, really. No indictments come out of them. Nobody goes to jail as a result of them. I'm only saying that people know I testified in front of the Senate about boxing industry. Nobody went to jail. Nobody got in trouble. Nobody got indicted. They're a show. They put on a show for people to, to make people think they're doing their job. So he did testify willingly. He was number three. Number two, Charlie Lucky Luciano. Luciano was the founding father of organized crime. We know that after he successfully planned the assassination of old time bosses Joe the Boss and Sal Maranzano back in the 1930s. It was after those hits, a new era of the mafia began with a commission and a structure to families. Luciano turned crime into a fully fledged business model and if he wasn't in a life of crime, he would have made a great CEO at a major company. Yes, he probably would have. So would have Frank Costello. And so would probably Paul Castellano. Smart guy, business guy. You know, he got knocked for that. But I'll tell you, you know, you can't be thugs in the street. You got to have some diplomacy about you. You got to have some business knowledge. You got to be able to bring in the money. Without that, no organizations exist. You got to be honest about that. So... Um, Luciano was a smart guy and a, uh, a very good dresser. As the boss of bosses at the time, that's what he was called, Luciano had to be taken seriously, and he dressed to look the part. Heads would turn as he walked down the street with some thinking he was an A-list Hollywood celebrity, not a crime boss. Lucky would sport the finest pinstripe suits in his heyday, completed with a Panama hat. They all wore the hats. He always made sure he looked dapper, and even in his aging days, he still looked smart. So he was number two. Okay, now, um, this is uh, going to be a tough question, but who do you think was number one? Of course, the dapper Don himself, John Gotti. And I will tell you, John knew how to dress. He really was a good dresser. Uh, I think the dapper Don moniker he got was well-deserved, well-earned. He dressed well. Let me just read. Everybody knows John, but let me read what they wrote about him. John Gotti is one of the more talked about mobsters of the late 20th century, a crime boss who enjoyed the limelight and managed to duck out of criminal charges, which brought about his nickname, the Teflon Don. Yes, he broke many old time rituals and mafia rules, and some say the mafia fell apart because of him. I don't believe that. The mafia fell apart because of the RICO statute. No doubt. He didn't help, but it was definitely the RICO statute. Truth is, whether you like or hate John Gotti, he was a good dresser and has been stereotyped as your typical mafia don, bringing the godfather to life. In his second nickname that we are focusing on now, though, he was called the Dapper Don. Gotti wore suits that cost thousands of dollars, true, and he would finish off any look with his clean press suits, handkerchief in pocket, pinky ring, hair neatly swept back, and sometimes an expensive cashmere scarf. I never saw John not dressed to the nines. When he didn't have a suit on, he was still dressed, uh, you know, to the nines, uh, so to speak. He always had, he was just always well-dressed, you know, wherever he was. There was times I would meet him at night, you know, in a club, just happened to be there, and I would bounce in, 
And he always looked good, even if he didn't have a suit on. So I think he deserves to be number one, really. So that's it. That's the 10 best. You agree with it or not? You know, we go through it really quickly again. Joe Adonis, number 10. Paul Castellano, number 9. Jim Colosimo, number 8. Lepke Butchalter, number 7. Al Capone, number 6. Bugsy Siegel, number 5. Maya Lansky, number 4. Frank Costello, number 3. Lucky Luciano, number 2 and John Gotti number one. So if you agree with that, let me know. If you have any other uh, thoughts or you know of any other mobster maybe that I missed that you say is a better dresser, uh, let me know in the comments. I'll look through them. We always enjoy seeing that. And uh, that's it for today. So hope you enjoyed it. How do I always leave you? Same way. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless. Yes, I'll see you next time.